So for those who don't know me, and I'm hoping you all do, my name is Noliwe Alexander, and sometimes you'll hear it, no, Noli, N-O-L-I. And I just want to say, before I even get started with anything, congratulations. You have now crested this summit of this silent retreat, <laughs> and now you're beginning your trajectory towards its completion. And even those who are first timers, maybe never had a, a retreat before, congratulations. And those who've done a retreat but never did a Zoom retreat, congratulations. And those who, everybody, congratulations. It's quite an accomplishment to finish as we're winding down. And also, just an invitation to still stay present. We are not quite there. I know that there's this looking at the watch. When is Friday happening? We're not quite there. So just enjoy this time and deep bows to your practice and your commitment. Thank you so much. So as we have been doing before these talks, I'm going to say a little bit about myself. It'll be very brief. I'm the daughter of Larry and Marjorie. And I'm a child of the 50s and 60s, and I'm happy to say that. I'm the granddaughter of Maggie and Sydney and Laverne and Elizabeth. I'm a wife, a mother, and I'm the grandmother of four-year-old Calvin. I'm a practitioner. I'm a healer, and I'm a wisdom seeker. And it took me a long time to feel into that presence of who I am. I've traveled many roads to get here, and there have been many twists and turns. But I feel as though the path has been cleared for me by my ancestors. I've never felt forsaken. But especially when I meet myself with truth, honesty, and integrity. <laughs> to be honest, it doesn't always happen. You know, and sometimes the road gets rocky. And the path is unclear, but then I just come back, collect myself again. And somehow, miraculously, because it's such great medicine and, and miracles almost, that the road clears for me. So today I'm going to be joining all the previous amazing talks that we've had with Sabra. She started us off. And Sousa and Janet and Ramona. Today, I'm going to be speaking about equanimity. And I do this all the time, but I, in, I title my talks. And this talk is called Falling in Love with What Is. Falling in Love with What Is. And it is this equanimity, this way in which it's part of those heart qualities. You metta, this loving kindness and friendliness that Janet so beautifully spoke about. How do we meet ourselves? Who was our first teachers in kindness? How does kindness lay in our hearts and actually sometimes transform ourselves? Karuna, compassion and mudita, appreciative joy, Yesterday, we had music, and we had such a beautiful talk by Ramona, just giving us these pathways into cultivation of a wholesome heart quality. And now, Upeka, equanimity. And for me, this last heart quality, this last Brahmavihara, this divine abode, it feels like the ground that all these other expressions can rest in. And even if we're faced with life's challenges and joys, where do we turn? What's your roadmap? What path do you take towards that phrase that was really from Ram, a late Ram Dass, but is now used with by Jack Cornfield quite often, loving awareness. 
What's your path? What's your roadmap? So you can turn in the face of life's challenges and its, and its joys. But I'm going to take a moment before I start going a little bit more into equanimity, and I'm going to share a poem. And many of you who have been in my small groups, you know, this is kind of what I love to do. For those of you who haven't, get ready. Here's another poem. So this poem is called Eagle Poem. It's by Joy Hargo. To pray you open your whole self. To sky, to earth, to sun, to moon to one whole voice that is you. And know there is more that you can't see, can't hear, can even accept in moments, steadily growing and in languages that aren't always sound, but other circles of motion. Like Eagle that Sunday morning over Salt Rock, Salt River, circling in blue sky, in wind swept, our hearts clean with sacred wings. We see you, see ourselves, and know that we must take utmost care and kindness in all things. Breathe in, knowing we are made of all this, and breathe knowing we are truly blessed because we were born and die soon within a circle, a true circle of motion, like eagle rounding out the morning inside of us. We pray it will be done in beauty, in beauty. Eagle Poem by Joy Hargrove. And Joy Hargrove is our first Native American poet laureate for the United States, and she writes absolutely beautifully. Her last name is spelled H-A-R-J-O, Hargo. So now here comes the meat of equanimity. So this is, I have to tell you, this particular Brahma Vihara, this divine abode is what's working me right now. It is exactly what is arising for me, which is why I was so happy to be able to share it. So I have been reflecting on some of what is happening in our world, and we could probably maybe agree, maybe not agree, but recognize it as a huge global moral crisis. It's political. It's economic. It's racial. The tensions have risen. It's white supremacy, not just here in the United States, but all over the world. It's health with pandemic. It's our climate crisis with mother nature calling us to heal the earth. It's poverty, it's homelessness. And that list goes on and on. And I've had to feel into how am I holding this? this incomprehensibility of our human condition. It truly boggles my mind, but more importantly, it has a direct and sometimes visceral impact on my heart. But I'm also having to wake up to this deeper inquiry about why is this, why, what is the awareness I'm holding in its discomfort? around the sorrows that's lingering in my heart. And these sorrows speak so specifically to equanimity, the fourth divine abode. It's complex, this world today. I just said, how do, what is your roadmap when things are too complex for us to hold? So I've asked myself a lot of questions because I said, this is really my work. Every year at the end of the year, my wife and I choose a word that we're going to work with for the year. And this year, my word was balance. 
So I've chosen this as my pathway right now. So here's some questions that I've been pondering, and maybe they can resonate with you. I don't know. How to calm the heart mind? How do I calm my heart mind? How do I rest in stillness without being numb and disassociated? How do I develop an equanimous heart mind in our troubled world? That balance. How do I view each of my life stages through the lens of absolute reality, not delusion, not fantasy? How do I fall in love with what is? Or at least break those patterns of avoidance. How do I find the middle way that the Buddha so frequently spoke to? Instead of holding the extremes, it's either good or bad, right or wrong. How do I find that middle way? And how do I allow my heart to open? But more importantly, I think, than just opening is staying tender, staying open. And all of these questions seem like they would continue to swirl, and they do. But that's what's been up for me lately, and that's what I have to speak from. I have to speak from what's alive in me, right? And I want to talk a little bit about the definition of equanimity and then tell you why it's become my most important teacher. You know, there was years ago when I would go to my bookshelf and I would pull out Webster's Dictionary, but now I go to dictionary.com because it's a new day and age. And I found that the definition of equanimity, which for a long time I didn't even know how what it was. And one of my teachers, um, Eugene Cash, does this often. He looks at the derivative of the name of what it is we're, we're actually calling in or, or going to be talking about. And I started doing that because it brought me so much more clarity. So the definition of equanimity, it is a mental and emotional stability or composure. Especially when there's tension. And it's a calmness. And another word they use is equilibrium. And just a real quick story. When I was really young, I might have been maybe 10 or something. My mom went to the doctor and she said she had an inner ear infection. And it caused her to have her equilibrium was off. And that was the first time I heard the word. But what she said is that I couldn't quite write myself, stand up right, straight, stay balanced. And that was the first time I really, I, I didn't understand it, but I actually understood that sense of balance and that you need to have that to carry through. And the other thing that they say about, equ about um, equanimity is that it really does bring about a calmness of temper. And that's one of the things I want to work with. I'm not temper prone, but sometimes it lays there for me. And I want to be aware of it. And we have been talking about so often this word poly, this term that we use. We use these poly terms, metta, karuna, mudita. And the Pali word for equanimity is yupeka. It's spelled U-P-E-K-K-H-A. And it's translated to mean to look over, to see without being caught in what is being seen. That's that hook, you know. To perceive or to see with patience or peace of mind. I like that. I like that. So equanimity being that fourth Brahma Vihara, the Buddha describes 
A mind that is filled with equanimity is abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. And when I hear that, I just want to say amen, amen to that. If I can live my life without hostility and ill will, amen. I agree. Ashe, I want that. So as I have been practicing with equanimity and trying to figure out how to cultivate it in my own heart, I had to figure out what equanimity isn't before I could actually kind of go into what it is. And I'm, let's describe what it isn't. Oh, another funny story. I have, my son, when he, he's almost 40 now, but when he was about 15, and I don't know if you remember when you were 15 or you have kids at 15 or how you responded to your parents, but I would have these heated discussions with him, right? Do your homework. Do the dishes, take out the trash, clean your room. And after we would go through this bantering back and forth, as a lot of parents do, he would then look at me and go, whatever. And it would infuriate. But equanimity isn't whatever. Just saying. It's not letting go of reasons of avoidance. It's not the reactive mind. And it's not indifference. It's not being numb and dull. That's not equanimity. It's definitely not what for whatever. It's not that. But what equanimity is, it's a well-developed heart mind. It's having faith in that's grounded in wisdom. It's a balanced countenance. It's insight, which is so often why we come to the cushion. It's freedom. It protects us from these these vicissitudes of life, these winds that come up and blow us here and there. It's the middle way. It's a responsive mind. It's staying present in an awakeful presence, mind and heart. And the other thing that equanimity is, is it it integrates both the body, well, all body, mind and heart all together, all the things we've been learning, all the things you've been practicing this week. Obviously, the Buddha had something really important to say about equanimity because he put it at the end of so many things, like that ground. It was like the closing of the parentheses. It's the fourth of the Brahma Viharas. It's the seventh of the seven factors of awakening. It's the tenth of the ten paramis or perfections. It is the ground that holds all of this together. It is the balance. And this is what we're cultivating when we walk into this practice of open-hearted awareness. And this journey has humbled me, this practice. It's allowed my heart to soften when there's been a heartbreak. Because of what I just said, the conditions in which we live in. but it's also allowed it not to be closed completely. And I'm thankful for that. I'm so grateful for that. So I'm going to tell you why this has become, this equanimity, this practice has become my my most important teacher. I have been on the path of the Buddha Dharma for close to 25 years. And again, I have got a lot of lessons behind me. I've learned sati, mindfulness, the four foundations of mindfulness, all of the pieces to it. And I've learned it from renowned teachers and scholars. 
I have memorized all the lists. And I know you guys have heard, you all, not guys, but you all have heard the lists, right? Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, Ten Paramis, Seven Factors of Awakening, The Three Evils. I mean, it goes on and on. I've learned them all. And I've practiced at retreat centers across this country and abroad. I've sat with queer, LGBT, BIPOC, disabled, elders, women-only sanghas. I've been in training programs for one year, two years, four years. I have taught Black American elders the benefits of mindfulness. I have supported youth sanghas and young adult sanghas. And I failed to mention, I'm sure this is something my wife is probably turning right now, all the hundreds of books, magazines, clipped articles that I've gathered over the years. I mean, a lot of them. But it wasn't until I started to incline towards the Brahma Viharas, towards these divine abodes, these immeasurables, did I really feel at home in my practice. It wasn't until I sat a metta retreat with Bhante Gudaratana, a Sri Lankan monk, did I feel the Dharma come alive in me. It wasn't until I practiced with my own open heart, recognizing my own suffering and bringing self-compassion to it, did I decide to actually offer the Dharma in my own voice. It wasn't until I took a whole year of practice with joy did I begin to live an authentic life. It wasn't until I chose to see my life unfold without excuses, without blaming, without fear. As I practice equanimity, did I finally fall in love with every ounce of my fragile fierce and tender self. I needed first to surrender to just this one phrase and this too. And let go of what I thought everything was supposed to be, the expectations. And if it was a particular way, being attached to making it different. And need I say, needing it to be perfect. I had to figure out how I could live simultaneously and continuously coming back to the path, even with the vicissitudes, even with everything that was going on in my life. I had to come back to the path over and over again, this path to liberation. For me, equanimity holds that balance for me. And it isn't easy, and it isn't passive. None of these beautiful heart qualities are passive. It takes courage just to meet yourself there and then to begin to take it on, whether through meditation or reading or practice or just in daily life. And this state of balance that equanimity gives us, it's like riding a bike. We have to have a centered equilibrium in order to stay on the seat. And if we fall, and my guess is we will fall, we just have to attempt to get back up. Upright the momentum. There's a middle way. It's a middle path of life. Equanimity is one of those pathways. It's, there's no certainty. But as Ramona said in the very first day, try it on. See if this is a practice that you can actually embrace, that speaks to you, comes alive in you. It has for me.
So I have found this source, this insight in me to continue to practice equanimity. And I'm drawn to four words that kind of keeps like the, keeps the motion going. Resilience, renewal, resistance, and refuge. They all are working me. They're working me all the time. This is a precious life. And there are uncertainties and there are judgments and criticisms, constant shifting of realities, and not to mention the conditions in which we are faced. But just in brief, there is a recipe. There is a way that we can, as the Buddha was called the great physician, Here's a recipe that we can use, maybe words, phrases, that we can remind ourselves. We can continue to open our hearts in these ways. This is the way it is. It's like this now. May I accept things exactly as they are, even if I want them to be different. May I see through the eyes of wisdom my life and world as it is. May I fall in love with life just as it is. Falling in love with what is, bringing ourselves back to our collective mind and our open heartedness. It's practice. It's not easy. It takes courage. And we all have that within us. This is the pathway. This is the middle way. I have one minute left, and I'm going to end with a quote. In spiritual life, there is no room for compromise. Awakening is not negotiable. We cannot bargain to hold on to things that please us while relinquishing things that do not matter to us. A lukewarm yearning for awakening is not enough to sustain us as we go through the difficulties involved in letting go. It's important to understand that anything that can be lost was never truly ours. Anything that we deeply cling to only imprisons us. And that's Jack Cornfield. A lukewarm yearning for awakening is not enough to sustain us through the difficulties involved in letting go. Family, thank you. <laughs>